Alleluia, Christ is risen. Mighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. He lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you for your children for all who are far testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying save yourselves from this corrupt generation so those welcomed his passage were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call all upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. And I called the, upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord? 
for all the good things he has done for me. I, lift, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed us from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from the first letter of Peter. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, he, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed. 
and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today our lectionary gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, and the passage is known as the road to Emmaus. Interestingly, Luke has us on the road a good bit in his gospel writing. If we think about it, early on in chapter 2, Mary and Joseph were on the road to Bethlehem for the census. And we know in chapter 10 that a road is the setting for the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we read that a road is what leads to the return of the prodigal son in chapter 15. In a non-pandemic time of crisis, we too spend a lot of time on the road, literally, literally, physically. For work, running errands, being a chauffeur for our children, driving to a friend's house or a game of golf, headed out to eat dinner, and sometimes we even make our way to a vacation destination. But not so much these days, and it feels awfully peculiar. Many of us aren't driving to the office daily and we aren't headed out on our normal routines. I know the money I'm not spending filling up my car twice a week with gas is still being put to really good use. It gets spent at the grocery store and then heads directly to the refrigerator where then my 15 year old son will quickly dispose of said groceries. I did not know it was possible to eat so many sandwiches or so many pizza rolls or thank goodness for this one, so many spinach salads. In all seriousness, it's been extra strange, a bit of a juxtaposition of sorts for our family. The three of us have been spending quite a bit of time on the road, the roads of our neighborhood, that is. It feels quite odd to be teaching one six-year-old to ride her bike without training wheels and one who just turned 15 to drive a car. It took Myers about a week and a half and a few scraped knees, but she's mastered balancing her bike and I bet now we've ridden the 600 yard stretch of road between our house and the stop sign a thousand times, and I love it. And before COVID-19, Blaine was to begin driver's ed and his behind the wheel time. So we're circling the block, learning the basics of driving a car, and I love it. But bike and car all wrapped up in one is a bit mind boggling. It feels strange. Likewise, I think the road to Emmaus must have felt a bit strange for Cleopas and his traveling companion. We know this because Luke is really good at the use of, of literary irony in his writing. So we, the reader, get to be aware of these facts, these important things that the characters don't know, and it makes it easy for us to be more empathetic, put ourselves into their shoes and imagine what it was like. We have the facts. During these first couple of um, readings after Easter, the gospel text is signed, understandably recount the stories of Jesus's post-resurrection appearances to the disciples. In each appearance, Jesus shows up and the disciples are afraid and unbelieving. And Jesus convinces them that he is their friend and their teacher raised from the dead and that they should continue his mission in the world. In this particular passage, we know that the scene is Easter afternoon, the same day as the discovery of the empty tomb. And I can just picture Cleopas and his traveling companion walking with their heads down, bantering back and forth, trying to make sense of all that had been theirs to see and hear in these last several days. We know nothing more of them in scripture, but we can assume they've been close to Jesus. Now, they're not part of his inner circle, of disciples, at least we've not heard them named before now, but we do know that they were close, close enough to these astonishing events that they seem to know it all. And despite all that they know, they've decided not to stay behind closed doors with the others. They've, I guess, had enough, and they've decided it's time to hit the road and return to their hometown of Emmaus. I think it's fair for us to assume also that they, like the other disciples, were now living with this sense of regret at not doing all that they could have done or maybe should have done. And as they make their way towards home, they're left only with their memory, and I'm sure every lumbering step must have caused them some pain. They were heading home, back to this familiar, the safe, the comfortable, back to people who knew and loved them before their worlds had been turned upside down. 
And then this stranger, we know it's Jesus, joins them on the road. He journeys with them. Jesus wants to know what they're discussing. They are so flabbergasted with that question that scripture tells us that they stop their walk. How could anyone not be aware of all of the things that have been going on, they wonder. And while en route to Emmaus, they walk and they talk with Jesus and Jesus teaches them about how he was revealed in scripture and he offers this deeper meaning to all that they've experienced. He shows them how these experiences have a higher purpose as foretold in scripture and how it's all leading to this greatest good. But it's not until they arrive at their destination that they actually realize they've been walking and talking with Jesus. They invite this companion journeyer to stay because it would be dark soon. It wouldn't have been safe for someone to travel in the dark alone. And as they sit down to eat, Jesus breaks the bread and he gives it to them. They realize it's him and he disappears. And once again, Cleopas and his companion hit the road and return the seven miles to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples what has happened. There is something about roads the way they bring us together, the way they pose danger, what they can symbolize. And in our lives, our faith journey lives, we spend a lot of time on a figurative road. And I want to share three quick insights from this Road to Emmaus passage that can help direct and convict our time on this road of faith. So first, there are unavoidable challenges and even some litter scattered on our road. Bumps and curves aren't really an easy thing for a six-year-old on a bike or a newer driver to negotiate, but they are unavoidable and they definitely keep things interesting. The same is true in our walk of faith. Just like Cleopas and the other disciple that day, it's not unusual for us to feel at times like things are out of control in our lives. For sure, the road to Emmaus is littered with shattered hopes and broken dreams. In our lives, there are curves called failures, bumps called poor choices, miles that tear relationships apart, a loop called confusion, speed bumps called friends, and even a red light or a stop sign that brings anxiety or life to a complete halt. From time to time, we too get caught up in the junk scattered in our lives so we can identify we can really identify with the two on the road, feeling dejected, ready to give up, weary and disappointed in our poor choices. Like them, we too lose heart when our expectations come to a tragic end. But the happy news is that the lesson learned on our roads, the ways we navigate these challenges, force us out of our comfort zones to the place where we can grow and become more mature in our faith. It does take some work, but the litter can be cleaned up and the curves can be traversed well. The walk for the two disciples started out in disbelief and sadness, but remember it ends in joy and excitement and love. The boat, that can all be true for our path too. Second, sometimes a U-turn is necessary. When Cleopas and his friend realized Jesus, I have to think that they probably left the dishes on the table and hit the road to retrace their journey back down that Emmaus road. They suddenly want to be back with the others unexpectedly, even the setting of the sun on a dark country road filled with potential robbers or deadly animals was not going to stop them. What had them confused just hours prior was now energizing them. What had them on the path home now had them wanting to be back in the thick of things. It's very familiar to the U-turn that we heard last Sunday's in last Sunday's reading with Thomas. Sometimes when driving, we realize that we need to make a U-turn because we figure out we've gone the wrong way or we need to be on a different road or because there's a traffic jam or a holdup ahead. Living authentically with God, for God in this world requires innumerable U-turns. Sometimes the direction we are headed seems right for a while. We do good things along the way. We may even think we're going God's way. However, the time can come when we realize that it's not God's way after all. And sometimes God even calls us to a whole new route altogether. And that route might require a U-turn. 
And what's so encouraging about this passage, just like for Cleopas and the other disciple, these U-turns can be awfully exciting and energizing for us and for our faith. Third, and finally, sometimes we might need to put on, the, on our glasses so we can see the road a bit more clearly. Particularly convicting in this passage is the fact that the disciples don't recognize Jesus. In his resurrection appearances, this is kind of a common thing. Mary in the garden thinks Jesus is the gardener. The seven disciples fishing fail to see that it's Jesus on the shore telling them to cast their net to the other side to catch fish. The problem was not that Cleopas and his companion could not see Jesus. It was that they could not recognize Jesus. The problem was not that they were not talking to him or that he was not listening. Neither was it that he was silent or that they were not hearing him. It was simply that they did not know that it was Jesus. So if the people closest to Jesus while he was on this earth missed him, it's no wonder that we do the same in our journeys. Additionally, we humans, we have this uncanny ability to miss the obvious sometimes. Kind of like running a red light. Or that moment when we realize that the glasses we've been searching for were on top of our head the whole time. There's something quite precious about these verses that offer us this picture of Christ walking with us in our darkest hours. And I think the biggest takeaway from this passage might just be that just because we don't recognize or hear him doesn't mean that Jesus is not with us. In fact, I'm not sure that there's ever a point on our roads that God is not with us. It's completely opposite, actually. We're the ones that fail to put on our glasses and see that the Holy Spirit is directing our journey, that Jesus is walking with us. We have these expectations of what Jesus should be like, how the Holy Spirit should be at work in our lives, what we want to happen. But quite often, Jesus doesn't look the way we expect. God doesn't always direct our steps the way we want them to go. Sometimes he's more hidden, like maybe in the back seat, and we actually have to really look hard. That's why it's so important that we live in this posture that's ready to encounter and see and trust Jesus. When we live in that posture of realizing Jesus, it changes everything. The way we talk, the way we encounter other drivers on the road, the way we intentionally slow our lives down, the way we serve others, the way we build our relationships, the way we make decisions, how we set our schedules for ourselves and for our children, and so on and so on to impact every aspect of our lives. Jesus is not just someone who shows up on Sunday. I love this road to Emmaus passage. It is convicting. It is powerful. It is full of obstacles. There is litter, U-turns, and lessons. And it has been my privilege to share with you this morning. Again, there is something about roads, the way roads bring us together, the way they pose danger, what they can symbolize, and certainly how Jesus journeys with us on them. Amen. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son he has worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Samuel and Ann, our bishops, Peter and Brad, our priests, Wendy, our deacon, and for all bishops and other ministers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we've asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. My Jesus, 
I believe that thou art truly present in the most blessed sacrament. I love thee above all things, and I desire to possess thee within my soul. Since I am unable now to receive thee sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace thee as already being there and unite myself wholly to thee. Never permit me to be separated from thee. Amen. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again From the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia.